Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life Hacks for Working Moms, the podcast that helps you overcome the overwhelm, embrace the chaos, and cultivate a life you love. My name is Megan Strand, and today is a good day because I am here with you. One of the things in my own life that I'm pretty militant about, as you may already know, is getting a good night's sleep. Not because I'm so disciplined, just because I really don't function well on reduced sleep. You can ask any one of my friends that know me well or anyone in my family. In this episode, we're going to dig in with a sleep expert. Her name is Terry Crowley. She's a registered nurse, a certified clinical sleep educator, and a spokesperson for the Better Sleep Council. Hi, Terry. Hi, Megan. How are you today? I'm excellent. I'm coming off a good night's sleep, so I'm good. Great. Good to hear. <laughs> I would love it, Terry, if you could just give us a brief overview about your professional experience with, with sleep. You're a registered nurse. Why did you decide to dig into this topic in your own career? Yes, well, I became involved in sleep through clinical research um, years ago, and during that time, a sleep doctor invited me to his sleep clinic in Houston, Texas, and I stayed up all night um, and slept all day for, for one week and watched people undergo sleep studies, and that was a turning point in my career because I realized how important it was. Um, to everyone's overall health and well-being, and I realized how many people suffered from sleep disorders, and there wasn't a lot of information out there about these sleep disorders and how it can really impact your your life. So it just became my mission at that point, and I've been involved ever since. Well, good for you. We're all we're all happy you're doing this work, Terry, because most of us need it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all know that we should be getting more sleep, most of us anyway, but what's, I mean, what's the top reason you think that people still don't? I think, I think it's the attitude, Megan. And, you know, I've been doing this for almost 15 years now, and I still find most of the problem I have with, you know, educate, educating people about sleep and getting the word out is sort of this inherent attitude that it's, it's a luxury, not a necessity, that you know, you can sort of get around it and the number of hours is more important than the quality of our hours in terms of wake. And I think people still, there's there's a bias that they look at sleep as time that's not well spent, right. sort of a waste of time, and that takes away from either good internet surfing or television shows or just the activities (laughs) of daily living. And so I think there's a fundamental inability to prioritize sleep and and respect sleep. And we still don't see it for all, you know, for the benefits that it brings to us. So I think to answer your question, it's, it's still an attitude problem. Everything suffers when we don't sleep from our productivity, like you just mentioned, to our mood and our immune system. In your experience, what is the most serious repercussion of not getting a good night's sleep? Like, how do you deal with people who are like, eh, I don't need it, it's fine? The first thing to go when we're sleep deprived is our insight into being sleep deprived. So it's a very interesting cycle that occurs. We tend to dismiss the symptoms we uh, of being sleep deprived. We forget what our baseline is. We for, we don't have our point of reference anymore hmm. to what it's what it feels like to be well rested, to wake up refreshed and restored. So it, it seems sort of subtle at first, but people don't get get it. And it's interesting, people that I've worked with in the sleep clinic setting their spouses or family members will come in and say, oh my gosh, I've got my mother back or oh my gosh, you know, I've got my my husband back. He's acting like himself again. So I think one of the major things is sort of an irritability or just a, a mood where, you know, you're just it's it's you're grumpy and grouchy and things like that and i think we fail to see it in ourselves but our family members and our coworkers and our friends see it much more readily than we do cuz we're fairly oblivious to it right and you know i use the analogy in fact you know sleep and getting enough sleep is so important to our safety and there's a topic out there um drowsy driving that doesn't get a lot of attention that should we we definitely should um, talk you know raise the discussion of drowsy driving just as we do drunk driving because it's just as dangerous and, and it's a big issue. But a lot of people 
they'll say, oh gosh, I'm stumbling, I'm slurring my words, I've been drinking, I know not to drive. People don't have that same, you know, awareness or, or the signs that it's not okay to drive if they're tired. You'd use the word, word symptoms with sleep deprivation. So outside of irritability, what are, you, what are the top things or the quickest things to go? You talked again about grouchiness or irritability, but what else do you see as a first symptom that maybe people maybe don't realize? Sure. A lot of it's, um, gosh, rubbing your eyes, excessive yawning, a real inability to focus. Um, people that are taught, you know, very tired during the day say, you know, at work, they can't get anything done. They can't stay on task. They tend to surf the internet more than people that are well rested. I mean, it's just sort of that anything um, reaching for sugary foods a lot during the day Mm. to stay awake after some people just get that, you know, caffeine overload at at a certain time. They'll they'll drink caffeine excessively in the morning. But um, after that, it's sugar foods, uh, high fat foods, anything to sort of stay awake and get some temporary energy. Um, and are these feeling, just people, are these people that you're dealing with in a sleep clinic setting or is this just anyone? Do you know what I mean? I mean, cause there's a difference between I'm only getting five hours of sleep a night and I think I'm fine. And people who are, have sleep apnea or something more serious where they're actually trying to get sleep, but they can't, or it's not quality sleep. Sure. And I mean, that's the problem where people that are saying, I get five hours of sleep at night, I'm fine, because the statistics and the research shows us that only one to three percent, possibly five percent of the population are short sleepers and that they're just genetically predisposed to to get by on, um, you know, say five or six hours of sleep a night. The rest of us need, you know, somewhere in that eight hour range. So, and there are people that, that are in the range yeah. of more than eight hours, right? Yes. It's oh, like a yes. bell curve, people, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. And some people, they always got some nine to 10 hours to feel. You know, there's some individual variances, of course. But I think we're under the, the misconception that a lot of us don't need that much sleep or can power through it or actually train themselves to get by on less than that eight hours. Well, I, it doesn't work. I think that does happen though, because I remember after I had my second child and when you have a child, you're just sort of naturally sleep deprived because it's, you know, you're up ridiculous amounts of time during the night. And I remember sure. not feeling tired at all, but I was kind of an idiot I mean, I remember feeling like I'm kind of stupid, but I don't actually feel tired. It was really strange because like I said, I need a lot of sleep. I like sleeping. So I, pri- I do mm-hmm. tend to prioritize it. But with that, after that second kid, I was just like, I'm just dumb. I mean, it's just, it was a weird <laughs> realization. Yeah. I didn't feel tired. I didn't feel like taking a nap. I just, I guess I just sort of got used to it, but I was definitely operating at a lower brain power level. <laughs> Right. And that's where you back again to losing that point of reference. And and whether it's just someone dealing with insomnia or just not scheduling enough sleep or any other sleep disorder, when they get that sleep back, they say they have that aha moment and say, gosh, now I know what it feels like to be productive and fully functioning and feeling good and feeling, you know, better mood, better outlook and on and on, all the benefits of sleep are, are realized again. And, you know, it, it, they're, they're back. <laughs> right, they're back, thankfully, right? What about yes. weight gain or weight loss as it relates to sleep? Any insights there? Yes, lots of research. The short sleep or untreated sleep disorders, anything that leads to insufficient sleep is going to lead to weight gain. And it has to do with hormones that are released during the night. They get out of whack when you're not getting enough sleep. And we found, I've, I've talked to several physicians about this, that we can't operate in, in a vacuum. We can't say, gosh, go diet, and here's your new diet, and here are your calorie restrictions, and go to the gym. Because if you don't look at diet, exercise and sleep as interconnected right. three-part um, foundation of a healthy lifestyle, you can't, you can't address any of those without addressing the other. So um, in fact, I've had a, a physician who said, gosh, I tried to motivate my overweight patients to diet. We, we called them every day. We said, Go, you know, here's a free gym membership. And it still didn't work. And until those people understood the importance of getting enough sleep or screened for sleep disorders, they couldn't do it. But once they incorporated sleep into the diet and exercise regime, 
they saw real results. And so that's what I've been, you know, telling people to really pay attention to that, to that sleep. That sleep piece. Well, you're going to see results. Not mm-hmm. only the physiological response of not getting enough sleep that you're talking about a hormonal response, but also going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, if you are just tired and you're reaching for something to kind of give you a boost, it's probably not going to be something that's real healthy for you. You're not going to be reaching for a cucumber. So absolutely. And that lower right. level, as you were just talking about operating from that lower level, like to lose weight, you have to be kind of on it and on top of it. And if you're not at your best, then I can imagine that psychologically, that's a hard challenge too. Yes. And the psychological ramifications of sleep deprivation are enormous. And those are often overlooked. You know, I mean, I think the popular press, we're getting a lot of good information on how sleep deprivation affects us physically, but cognitively, you know, you're looking at outlook, motivation, um, enhanced mood, resilience, just feeling, you know, having that motivation and, and feeling like I can do this. And I mean, it all goes away when we don't get enough sleep. So when you think about sticking to a diet or sticking to a, an exercise routine or doing anything along those lines, that's where sleep is vitally important to giving you those emotional, you know, tools we need, Whether I mean, for everything. I mean, even relationships are better with sufficient sleep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and again, we're talking about there is a lot of information out here. So what's the thing that people still don't really understand about getting a good night's sleep? I mean, there, you kind of hear the standard things. You need to get eight hours of sleep, blah, blah, blah. Are there things that you feel like people don't necessarily know or that's not talked about? You mentioned a couple of them earlier, like drowsy driving, things like that. But are there things that you feel like as a sleep educator you wish more people knew? Well, I just think that, you know, that it's back to the attitude and respecting sleep. And I still think with that sort of underlying fundamental disrespect of sleep, it's the first thing to fall off when we get busy. And so I get back to our our lives in terms of, you know, late night screen time. Well, I'll get, I have to answer those emails. I've got to get on, you know, see what the news is, see what the latest show is. I still think that's going to be the big hurdle we have to, you know, cross to to get back to getting the good sleep habits and getting sufficient amount of sleep. And I know people I've talked to say it only takes about a week really of getting rid of that late night screen time where they then it becomes a, a new habit and they don't even like turning, you know, right. having that late night screen time because they do see that what it does in terms of causing them to fall asleep. It's harder to fall asleep and they fall asleep later. Um, so I think it's back to prioritizing sleep. I also think there's some misconceptions out there about do I have a sleep problem? We've had, mm. I've worked with people that come to the sleep clinic and say, I don't know why I'm here. My doctor sent me here. I don't have a sleep problem. I can fall asleep anytime, anywhere. I'll fall asleep at the red light. I fall asleep in, at the movie theater. I fall <laughs> That's asleep. That's helpful. <laughs> you know, in the lazy boy recliner when the second I get home from work, so I can't have a sleep disorder. Well, that's the problem. If you say you fall asleep when the second your head hits the pillow, you're sleep deprived. Hmm. Interesting. And it could be a yeah, it could be a voluntary, you know, a voluntary sleep deprivation in terms of you're not prioritizing it or scheduling it and just not getting it, or you could have a sleep disorder. I do know several people that can fall asleep anywhere, so I hope you're all listening right now. <laughs> yes, and we we tell people about boring meetings. That's our our face, especially when I give talks about sleep. I say, um, you know, falling asleep in a boring meeting. You can be bored, but if you fall asleep, that still means you're bored. Being bored doesn't mean you fall asleep. Being bored right. is just being bored. We just, <laughs> falling asleep means you're sleep deprived. You're Two sleep deprived. You've got an issue. That's funny. Yeah. I, I I know that it's good f- to sleep cool, but I read recently that the ideal temperature is 65 degrees, which is probably a couple of degrees lower than I had been sleeping. Is that true? Mm-hmm. For a lot of people, um, you know, there's some variations in if people are hot sleepers and cold sleepers. Hmm. And everyone has sort of their individual temperature preference. But we do find that the cool sleeping temperatures help with the onset of sleep. And um, the cooler the temperatures, more likely to fall asleep um, 
quicker and, and a little bit more easily. Now, what we recommend to people is to layer up because your temperature fluctuates during the night. It tends to rise toward the waking hours, and that's when you're going to want to have a couple layers of blankets to uh, throw off some covers if you feel feel warm. But yeah, the, the cooler temperatures do help with sleep onset. Sometimes we recommend um, a warm bath at night before bedtime because getting out of that warm bath will drop the core temperature a little bit and that helps with sleep. Oh, onset. that's why that's helpful. Interesting. Didn't yeah, and there's that. some new products. Yeah, they're new. Um, there are some very interesting innovations that will actually heat and cool the surface, the sleep surface, rather than you know worrying about the thermostat and the ambient room temperature. Mm. So I think those are getting more attention because a lot of people find those um, very helpful. Interesting. So yeah, it, technology, yeah. Sh- yeah, should be evolving. That's it, it evolves everywhere else. So why not? Right. Right. Um, talk about, okay, so let's say you are sleep deprived or you just got a tor- terrible night's sleep the night before and you know you're tired. What about taking a nap? Is this something you should do? I've heard that you should. I heard that, I've heard that you shouldn't. What's your take? Absolutely yes to that. And <laughs> I still, Thank there's you, a Terry. lot of, <laughs> yes, you, you, you're a okay to nap. <laughs> I give you, I give you a, uh, Full, full, uh, full permission to take naps. That. Yeah, full permission. And the thing is, and obviously in a work setting, we need to have sanctioned and safe napping. You know, we can't um, sneak naps when you're supposed to be doing something else. But we we're looking at very transparent, sanctioned napping at the workplace if needed, and obviously outside of the workplace if needed, in in a safe and doing it safely. Um, when we talk about naps, I think the only problem. There are some insomniacs who will, you know, a daytime nap may sort of mess up falling asleep at night, but that's if, usually if it's an extended uh, sleep time. Okay. A quick nap during the day under 30 minutes, preferably before 3 o'clock in the afternoon if you're sort of on a regular sleep schedule and not, not a night shift worker, will will do a lot for you in terms of sort of, you know, getting your energy levels back to where they should be, increasing productivity. NASA has done a lot of research. It's all been positive with good results. And I think we need to really look at naps as a, as a good thing and not really interfering with your nighttime sleep. And there's so many things out of our control in terms of, you know, the dog barking next door at night, the baby right. waking up teething and there are a lot of things that you know and and to sort of waste the whole next day you know trying to fight through a a sleepless night I think a nap is a great remedy and we should really look at naps um, as a more useful tool than than we are currently and utilize them in in the workplace and in our daily lives more amen I'm all for that I definitely I've been known you know it's weird though as I've gotten older I never used to nap ever, ever. I can sometimes, it's the strangest thing. Like sometimes I'll just feel like I have hit a wall kind of Mm -hmm. early afternoon. I can literally put my head down and I think literally what happens is I fall asleep and then wake right back up. I mean, it's strange. It's like my brain just resets itself. It'll be like maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It's so Mm -hmm. strange, but it's, it helps. And it's just like, Oh yeah, okay, that's good. I can keep going now. Yeah, it's amazing what it can do. And and just like you say, even very short naps can do a lot of good. So I think people have to be more receptive. You know, I still I give talks um to corporations and you know all sizes businesses and boy, I still get the looks um when we talk about oh, I'm sure. setting up a you know sanctioned work, you know, nap places yeah. at work. You know, people say, Oh gosh, no, I'd get fired for even suggesting that. So that's where I get mm-hmm. back to that are you know, we have got to change. As a culture, the culture. yeah, we've got to Yeah, yeah. Turn it around. I agree mm-hmm. with you. I agree with you. Well we're we're sort of getting to the end of our time, but I do want to talk very quickly about kids and sleep because that I feel like is a gray area for me because what your kids need one year could be very different from what they need two years later. So what's kind of the general rule of thumb for kids and how much sleep they should be getting? Yes, this is, um, we'll plug the National Sleep Foundation right here. They have a great infographic on their website that um, goes through the age ranges and the recommended amount of sleep. Say for um, like toddlers, one to three years, they recommend 12 to 14 hours of sleep. Preschool years, three to five years old, 
we're talking 11 to 13 hours, school age kids, and that's the 5 to 10 range. They need 10 to 11 hours. Now, what's the most interesting thing we've been dealing with in the last few years, and there's lots of incredible research out there to support this, is teen sleep needs. Right. And the, the teenagers we're looking at need eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep per night, which you know, people have to get that through their heads. They need this for their health, for their psychological well-being. And if they're not getting that, there are a lot of uh, things that happen and a lot of things that we have, um, you know, attributed to teenage angst in terms of mood problems, health, you know, um, risk-taking behaviors, depression. A lot of this is, can be linked back to just plain sleep deprivation. That's how serious it is. So, wow. that, yeah, that's why you're seeing a lot of um, – there's a large uh, nationwide effort to start schools later, especially um, the, the high schools. Right. So these teenagers get their sleep. And you think about the fact that they're new drivers – they're sleep deprived. They're trying to do a oh, lot, geez. and then they're trying to get an education. Right. Well, and, and they, so, they tend to stay up later. And you're right; high schools tend to start early, so that right. doesn't even allow for getting the full night's sleep. Yes, and their biology predisposes them to staying up later. It's not one of those things that we can sort of nag them into going to bed later. They really are fighting um, a different sort of. Um, you know, clock that they've got, their internal clock is really pushing them to, to go to bed later and sleep later. So I think now we're going to have to, you know, really make, to accommodate this biological need so we can keep them safe and healthy. Terry, this has been so, so fascinating. I really, really appreciate your time and your expertise. If people want to find out more about you and about sleep, how might they do that online? Well, I can be found at the Better Sleep Council website, and that is at bettersleep.org. And then I also recommend two other websites for people um, that have great information on sleep. One is the National Sleep Foundation, and that's at sleepfoundation.org. And then there's the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and that can be found at aasmnet.org. Perfect. And I will put those in the show notes too, so that there will be resources easy to click from from our website. And you can find Life Hacks for Working Moms on iTunes, as well as Stitcher Smart Radio. We do, do recommend you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can also find us on the website, lifehacksforworkingmoms.com or lh the number four wm.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Megan Strand. And on behalf of Terry and myself, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Life Hacks for Working Moms. We'll catch you next time.